everybody, this is going to be a very special episode. It's going to be episode 131. Um, this one is going to be a four-parter. Uh, so you guys, welcome back to Game of Crimes. This is something that's been in the works for a while, Murph, and it was mm -hmm. could not. It only could have happened. It couldn't have happened until we had number one, the right introduction, which you arranged, and number two, the right timing, because our next guest left his current job, had a break, and then he's starting a new job. And this is the only podcast interview he's done about this case. Yeah, and so our guest today is Ken Mead. He was a, uh, uh, I think, a 26-year veteran of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. A uh, special thank you goes out to our good buddy, retired Vegas cop, Bruce Gintner, who made the introduction. And, and as you'll hear, um, I, we were trying, one of our listeners came in months and months ago and says, hey, I'd love to hear more about the Mandalay Bay shooting. What can you do? And I just happened to call Bruce and said, you know anybody? He said, well, how would you like to speak to the lead investigator from the Mandalay Bay shooting? He's my cousin. And so that's Ken Mead. Um, and like you said, we had to wait. His agency did not approve him talking about this, even though they go around the world doing briefings to different audiences on this. For whatever reason, they they turned us down. And, you know, that's their right. We're okay with that. We still love you guys out there. But uh, to have the lead investigator on the Mandalay Bay shooting, you're going to hear things that – you know, probably didn't come out to public knowledge. Um, we can't thank Ken enough for this. Bruce can't thank you enough. We're going to bring Bruce on here at some point because he worked a lot of uh, undercover uh, vice and narcotics stuff in Las Vegas. And some of the stories he's told me, when some of the conferences we've been to are eye-opening, will cause your draw to drop, it will cause your jaw to drop, and will probably bring tears to your eye laughing so much because it's hilarious some of the stuff that goes on out there. So... Um, this is a really special episode, and like you said, Morgan, it's you know it's actually divided up into to four different sections. Yeah, it was so long. Three, we came in at three hours and fifty minutes, and we end up with a, the, a mass shooting he was involved in on like his last two days of work. But uh, this is all about the October first, uh, twenty seventeen shooting that happened out in Las Vegas. Um, it was the Route ninety one Harvest Music Festival. Um, the point of attack of obviously was Mandalay Bay, and uh, you, you, you. So what we're not going to, a couple things we're going to do. I'll just give you the quick uh, details here, real quick, and we'll do our quick housekeeping. Mm -hmm. But wanted to preface this, but the number one, we're not going to do small town police blotter. There's nothing funny about the story. We have a little fun in there, but there's nothing funny about the story. Uh, number two, this is not about the response. There are a lot of heroes involved in the response. I just got through watching one on Fox Nation, the streaming service, uh, talking about the Las Vegas massacre, listening to first responders and some of the officers in the SWAT team. This is about the investigation. Right. And I will tell you, you will find out stuff in this investigation. He puts some conspiracy theories to bed. He just pokes a hole in them. It just completely deflates them. I, I just, one of the things I got to tell you, Murph, I got, I, it just pissed me off, uh, you know, uh, even though I've had a long relationship with Fox. Listening to one of the guys they put on there goes, well, I've got no evidence, but, and then he goes on to spout a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Got no evidence. That That's the key right there. And the one thing we didn't tell you, Ken's also going to tell you about the UNLV shooting that yeah. happened in December of last year, right before he retired. That's why I said two days before he retires, he's like, I'm going to get killed if I get killed. Um, yeah. You know, so two days, but, but guess what? Two days before he retired, he still saddles up and goes out, you know, because that's what he does. Professional. Yeah. So guys, hey, real quick, before we get into the story, as you guys know, just real quickly, go hit the Apple Spotify. Tell us what you think of these episodes. Spotify allows you to rate each episode, give us some feedback. Head on over to our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com um, for everything you know about the show. We've got merch, we've got books there. Follow us on social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. You know, also ga check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We just got through recording our case of the month for January. Um, we get into some really good things about um, uh, parents whose uh, child was involved in a school shooting and being charged with involuntary manslaughter, talking about terrorism coming across the border. Just some neat things. So go down there uh, and also go to Facebook.com. Just type in Game of Crimes fans, um, our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. Um, you know, just answer a couple questions, get involved. We'll have some good discussions about this. So I'm kind of keeping it short on the front side mm -hmm. because we've got so much to get to, Murph. So, you know, um, it's one of those things. This is, um, you know, you, you can't, uh, the discount of 58 people, uh, 800 wounded, 58 died, 800 wounded. You know, this is as largest mass shooting in United States history. So nothing funny about this. And so, you know, uh, rather than doing our usual stuff, you know, we're just going to say, hey, let's just get into the story. We'll come back to you at the very end just with our quick thoughts. All right. So, Absolutely. guys, uh, Ken Mead, 
uh, retired now, Las Vegas Metro PD, telling us about the real story about uh, Mandalay Bay and Las Vegas, October 1st, 2017. And I will say, not being not, not meant to be funny, but get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. You're going to hear the true story about what happened at Mandalay Bay. So, guys, this this is an episode that has been a long time in coming for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, to get access to one of the key people, we had to wait until he was retired because there's uh, just as we did when we talked with Michael Coyazo uh, about the Covenant School shooting. A um, lot of politics involved, a lot of bureaucracy involved, red tape, you know, legalities. Um, and the second thing is, um, I mean, this this has been a request from a lot of people to say, hey, can you get somebody on? So we just had to kind of get the timing right. So the timing is right because, first of all, let's welcome you, Ken Mead, to the show. Retired. We can say officially retired now, right? Yes, sir. As of the 18th. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm bowing. <laughs> <laughs> and you've only got a short window. We won't say where you're going to go, but you've only got a short window before you're gainfully employed again, right? I do. I have uh, six days as of today. So, uh, right back into it. And so, again, we won't say where you're going to go, but it's kind of paramount that we get this interview out now because you may in- encounter some restrictions later. Is that maybe accurate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's a very similar uh, type role. Just uh, with a different agency and a um, different scope, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, Murph, and I think, you, you know, you, first of all, let's kind of set the context real quick, too, because you helped us arrange this. How did we get this interview once again? Well, we've, we've got a, a very good friend, um, Bruce Gentner, that we'll just throw out there. And uh, Gents, uh, Bruce is retired, Vegas PD. I met him through some uh, private companies that uh, occasionally will hire Javier and I to accompany them at, at various law enforcement conferences, usually the bigger ones like ACP and that type of thing. And got to be friends with Brent, with Bruce. And uh, one of our listeners had actually written into us, I'm guessing maybe a year ago, maybe not that long, but it's been a while, and said, hey, it'd be great to hear the true story about the Mandalay Bay shooting in Vegas, you know, the strip shooting. So I reached out to Bruce and, and I'm like, you know, were you working then? And he said, no. But uh, I said, do you know anybody? He said, well, just so happens the uh, lead investigator is my cousin. And uh, one of his good friends, I guess, was the leader of the SWAT team that that kicked the door open. But I believe he's still on the job, so he we can't bring him on the show. But um, through Bruce Gettner, that's the whole reason we met Kent Mead. And, and Ken didn't hesitate in the, in the slightest other than, you know, we had to wait till he retired. So... True honor to have you on here, brother. I've, we've been doing a lot of research, and it's horrific what happened out there, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. Well, and, and part of this, too, we, we talked before we got started. This is, you know, because kind of set the stage. We're going to talk about October 1st, 2017. You know, and th- this is what happened in Las Vegas out by Mandalay Bay. Um, it was the... Um, uh, the uh, I'm just sorry, just spaced out the name again. The the event that was going on, the uh, Route 91 Harvest Route Festival. 91. Yeah, and that, I remember Jason Aldean was on stage when this all started because he's talked about this too. Um, and I woke up that next morning. I was driving to Pennsylvania. I got in like at one o'clock in the morning. I wake up that morning to go speak somewhere, and this is the first piece of news I got. And it's like you know, oh my god. So, but we're going to talk about that. But one thing we decided to talk about is a lot of folks can go see that movie. Eleven minutes. It came out from Paramount. You've got a role in that, right? I did, yes. They uh, they recorded uh, probably four or five hours of uh, footage, and I think I was on about three minutes. Well, congratulations. But yes, I was, in, I was in episode four for that one. Congratulations. That's about the way it works, right, Mark? <laughs> oh, yeah. We Javier and I did eight hours of filming in Bogota on Narcos, and I think we are on screen for three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> they realized your lack of acting uh, capability. Yeah, it it's, it's, had, it took them a while to figure that out, but they figured it out. <laughs> Yeah, we just had Boyd Holbrook on too. That was uh, we just his episode came out. Boyd played Murph in Narcos, and um, it was amazing the amount of hours they shot. You know, to your point, you use a lot of footage, but they boil it down. But that's the problem. You've got five hours of information out there. They boil it down to the three minutes. That's important mm-hmm. to them, not that it's important to you. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So 
what we talked about, a lot of information out there about the actual shooting itself. We're going to talk about some of that. But there's a lot of stuff that has not made it out about the girlfriend. Uh, look, we have a policy here. We don't give airtime to room temperature pieces of shit. So the POS doesn't get his name read. He doesn't get memorialized in any way. So we just refer to him as POS or however you choose to refer to him, Ken. But we we want to talk about, you know, let, let's talk about the shooting and the investigation. But then let's talk about the stories behind the story, the things that didn't make it out. Because there's, you know, the one of the biggest questions still to this day is why, you mm-hmm. know. Why did it happen? So, but as we do with everybody, though, we kind of set the stage for everybody. But as we do with everybody, close and Ostra, thing of ours. How'd you get started in this? Were you happen to be down on the strip one day, got arrested by the cops because you were handing out them damn flyers that I got tired of people giving me every time I walked through Vegas? What was the deal, man? <laughs> no, so actually, uh, I grew up in Southern California, and uh, I'd kind of come from a family of law enforcement, and so it was something that always interested me. Growing up, um, I grew up in a not so great part of Southern California uh, as a, as a kid, uh, kind of West Covina, La Puente area. So it definitely had a, it's uh, rough spots, uh, growing up. Um, so my uncle, he was a, uh, uh, deputy sheriff with, uh, LA uh, County Sheriff's department. Um, and so I kind of grew up with that as my, uh, let's say role model, but uh, that was kind of my paradigm as far as what law enforcement looked like growing up. And so, great agency. Uh, as I as I got older, um, probably you know late high or late junior high, early high school, um, I was living in a town called Fontana, uh, more yeah. towards the Inland Empire, and uh, I decided that I wanted to kind of give it a shot and talk to my mom and said, "Hey, I, I think I'm going to try to be a police explorer." And I, gosh, I was 15, and I actually just found my uh, ID card, and I, I think I looked like I was about 10 in the photo <laughs> as well. But um, yeah, so that's kind of how I got started. So I was a police explorer in Fontana, uh, I think in probably '92, and uh, it kind of progressed from there. So um, did that up until the end of high school, and then uh, once high school started, I uh, ended up going into uh, my undergrad. Um, yeah, so kind of just progressed from there. Where'd you go to college at? So I did my undergrad at University of Laverne. Uh, which is again another small, uh, real small town in Southern California. Uh, played soccer for them um, for a year. I realized like I was not going to. No, it was division division three, so they didn't give scholarships. But I had a, a great academic background, so I didn't really pay for much besides my housing there because I got a lot of academic uh, grants and scholarships as well. Morgan, um, that means he was smart. In case uh, you pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I quickly realized that I was not going to play professional soccer. So I realized that I needed to really focus on my education. So I uh, did that and got my bachelor's degree in three years. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, working as a cadet with Chino Police Department because uh, I wasn't really old enough to start testing for any sort of police department. So um, yeah, I stayed at Laverne and uh, had a great time there. Worked at Disneyland all through college. Um, you you know, did? did a, I did How? work at Disneyland, yes. So I had a friend of mine out in Orange County, but in Florida, um, okay. and he ended up retiring, but, but went to work at security for, you know, uh, there's Walt Disneyland and then there's Walt Disney World. So Disney yes. World is in Florida. Disneyland is in Anaheim. Um, so uh, what was it? So come on, you got to have a couple good stories about working. Oh, there's a <laughs> lot of good you, stories. <laughs> what did you do there to start with? Yeah, you know, so I like to tell people, you know, I was Peter Pan or I was goofy or something, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it certainly wasn't that glamorous. Well, Mark's, I uh, we've, we've got the goofy role lined up on our podcast. So that's, uh, Oh, yeah, I got that part covered. <laughs> no, I was uh, I was a custodian. I was day shift custodial, which was a, uh, they, we called ourselves sweepers. Uh, so I was a sweeper, which was great, though. Um, you know, I was really working with everyone that was my own age and it was all high school and college kids. And uh, I had pretty much free roam of the park and it was, uh, you know, much different there. It wasn't as crowded as it is now. Um, what was the worst yeah, I, thing I, you ever swept up? Oh, I mean, a lot of bodily fluids. Uh, <laughs> oh. there, we had one time there was a, uh, it's, it's the ride has changed now. It's in the process of changing, but down towards splash mountain, we had a kid that was running and, uh, tried to kind of go under the chain ropes and ended up catching his eyelid on the uh, one of the chain ropes. Oh, jeez. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, pretty graphic out there. So we ended up uh, having to go out and clean up a lot of the, the blood that was out there. But, yeah, a lot of body fluids. You'd be surprised the amount of uh, interesting things that uh, get dumped and left at uh, Disneyland Parks in uh, oh. various locations. <laughs> so. Thanks a lot, pal. I could have <laughs> never go to Disney World again yeah. without going, oh, I wonder who stepped here. <laughs> that, that being said, I mean, I'm still a big Disney fan. Uh, we still go quite a bit. And uh, 
you know, I've always kind of uh, thought that I would, at some point in my career, love to circle back and kind of end my career working for, you know, corporate Disney doing, you know, global security or something. Cool. Um, so yeah. Very that, cool. Would be, had, that would be interesting. So, but how, so did you go then from Disney into law enforcement or what was that path like? So I did. I, uh, I, I was at Disney and then uh, I... Again, I was only 20 at the time when I got my bachelor's degree, so I, I wasn't really able to test for any agencies. Um, while I was at Laverne, I did my field research on police use of force with Pomona Police Department. So I was out doing field research and doing uh, ride-alongs fairly regularly with Pomona Police Department, and they were gracious enough to have allowed me to do that and kind of give me a little behind the curtain look at uh, the way their police department worked. Uh, so I kind of got a taste for it then, and uh, in all honesty, you know, I was uh, fairly, I was probably all of about 5'10 and 130 pounds when I was in, in college and running so much with soccer. And I, I thought, you know, I need to get out there and see if I could actually do this physically. Uh, so it was, it was part, you know, research and working towards my bachelor's degree, but it was also part personal that I wanted to get out there and kind of see if it was something that I could actually do. Uh, I actually started out as a pre-med major and ironically enough, uh, first time I saw a dead body, I said, Nope, it's not for me. And then uh, now <laughs> I, mean, I spent, look where you ended up I at. spent yeah. 26 years looking at dead bodies. So yeah, I think the timing was just a little bit off when I was, uh, entering undergrad, but, well, pre- but yeah, how so did I transitioned. You get to, how did you get to pre-med? Was that based on your writing was shit like mine? Or, I mean, how did you end up being, you know, what, what, what made you, you had the law enforcement background. What made you decide, Hey, I think I want to do pre-med instead. Yeah, so I initially started out thinking that, you know, I want to be a doctor and I uh, thought it would be a great occupation. And I remember uh, they took us, uh, I think my first semester, they took us to a morgue at one of the local hospitals to just kind of give us some exposure. And uh, yeah, I ended up having some nightmares after that and thought, you know, this is probably not the best fit for me. So I quickly transitioned, uh, ultimately ended up getting my bachelor's degree in abnormal psychology uh, from the University of Laverne. So, you know, stayed in a kind of a behavioral science medical type environment, but uh, more focusing on the mind as opposed to the body. Well, your degree is going to come in handy on this podcast between all three of us. So, <laughs> you start doing <laughs> diagnosis for you guys. I'm going to charge you for that, though. Uh, well, I'm, I'm listed all over the DSM four. Trust me. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So, I, again, I mean, I I, I was at uh, Laverne and then uh, working for uh, Chino PD as a cadet, kind of to. I had a little bit of a bridge time between when I uh, graduated college to when I actually uh, was 21 and able to kind of start testing for police departments. So, um, working as a cadet, you know, doing reports and working alongside the uh, the officers at Chino Police Department, uh, again, another small city in Southern California. And then uh, once I turned 20 and a half, I started really testing for police departments and uh, I tested for LAPD and Pomona PD and uh, uh, I guess like um, Steve said, you know, Bruce was my cousin and he was working for uh, for Las Vegas Metro already and said, hey, maybe you should come out and test. And ironically enough, you know, Bruce and I worked at Disneyland together and uh, in fairness, and you know, Bruce will be happy to hear this, but you know, Bruce was in the Marine Corps for a long time, so I really look up to him growing up. He was uh, kind of a role model for me and a father figure for me as well. Whoa, whoa, so, whoa. I know, yeah. Bruce, you need to raise your standards there. No, <laughs> no, he was great. So, uh, you know, I always looked up to Bruce, and um, again, I, I admired the fact that he was in the military and then went right into law enforcement, so I, I really tried to follow in his footsteps as best as I could. Um, so, yeah, I tested for uh, Vegas Metro uh, along several other agencies, and Vegas hired me first right at 20 and a half, and uh, I packed up and moved from Southern California to, uh, to Vegas. Had wow. you ever been in Las Vegas before? I had uh, probably several times as a kid, and I absolutely hated it. Uh, I thought it was boring. At that time, you know, Probably, you know, late 80s, early 90s. There wasn't much for kids to do in Vegas. You know, it's changed quite a bit now. But uh, yeah, I hated Vegas it. Vegas went through that whole phase of where they wanted to make it family friendly. Come here, yep. you know, the family. And then, like, they realized it didn't work. And so, what was their latest ad campaign? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, it's gone back and forth a couple different times. But, you know, when I first came to Vegas, uh, I think we stayed at the old Aladdin Hotel, which isn't even there anymore. I think it's the uh, Planet Hollywood now. Yeah, and isn't um, the flamingo been torn down too? Uh, I'm not sure to be honest. I'd have to. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know to be honest. There's a couple yeah. of the old ho- hotels I know, the ones that got torn down because you've got like the wind and the, the and the uh, uh, you know all of these new. I believe the flamingo has. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we stayed at uh, the Aladdin, and uh, I hated it and said I'd never come back here. And uh, again, lo and behold, you know, 10 years later, here I was uh, signing I, up and joining the I police academy. I don't like academy. dead bodies, and I'm not coming back here, and here yeah. you're, you're over yeah, two I, now. I wasn't, so. I wasn't very good at uh, keeping my own promises to myself, apparently. <laughs> Well, well, let's start talking about Vegas. So, when you got on, uh, how big was your how big was your class that you went through the academy with? So, I hired on. Uh, so, I tested in ninety seven. Um, I wasn't old enough uh, at the time. You could test at twenty and a half, and as long as you essentially started by twenty one, they would let you do it. Uh, so, I was supposed to start in, I believe, August of ninety seven. Uh, but again, I wasn't old enough, so they pushed me to January of ninety eight. Uh, at that time. They were doing some pretty massive hiring, uh, so I think I remember, you know, driving out from California and having to take the test. And uh, I think there was three or four thousand people that were testing, and uh, you know, they said, you know, we're only going to bring in about 150 to 300 officers. So I thought, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to, you know, make the make the cut for this. Um, you know, I really didn't have too much life experience. You know, I'd gone straight from high school to college and really hadn't experienced the real world. Um, so tested at a big, uh, Cashman field, which is the old baseball stadium we have here. That's still there. So, you know, 3000 people crammed into a, a written test and I ended up finishing in the, the top 10% and, uh, ended up getting hired right away. First shot. So, uh, sweet. Yeah. I, I kind of was like, well, I guess I'm doing this. So yeah, I ended up starting the Academy in January of 98. Uh, the class that I started with, I think we started out probably 125 people, which is a very big class for Vegas. Um, and I think uh, by the time we started day one, uh, January 26, 98, I think we were whittled down to probably just above 100, you know, 105, 108 or something. What caused the others to drop out? Oh, I think various reasons. I think people, you know, had other job offers. Um, you know, they started yelling at you pretty quickly, even before you got hired. So I think some people figured, nope, it's not for me. <laughs> um, you know, there people have stuff in their backgrounds that end up coming up late or, you know, the polygraph or something comes up that they can't make, yeah. make their academy dates. So, yeah, I think we started out just above 100 or so. Murph and I still laugh about it. Murph's got a story too. I think we've told this a long time ago, but it's worth repeating about the guy who didn't realize you had to carry guns at DEA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was in my class and, you know, we had 50 folks in the class and he was a big strapping guy, muscular guy, almost looked like a bodybuilder. It's about six, five, six, six. I mean, just a good looking guy. He's chemist by profession. And, you know, after we'd been to the range a couple of days and, and in classes for the first week, we showed up class one day and he's no longer there. And like, what the hell happened? They wouldn't tell us for the longest time, but eventually we found out that he didn't realize you carried a gun as a DEA special agent. Yeah. But <laughs> so for, ironically enough, you know, I had never really been around guns. I had asked my mom for a BB gun growing up and she said, absolutely not. You know, shoot you know, your eye the out. Old, the, yeah. The old adage, you'll shoot your <laughs> eye out. The old Christmas story <laughs> adage. Um, yeah. So I said, you know what, if I can't get a BB gun, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, go become a police officer and get her one. So um, <laughs> I hadn't really shot guns prior to that. I think I went uh, with a old neighbor I had and, uh, he kind of gave me a couple different opportunities to shoot different types of guns. And I said, all right, well, I'll pick this one. This one fits best and feels best. And that was it. I had fired maybe, you know, 20, 25 rounds out of a gun uh, before I actually went to the Academy and was carrying one every day. So yeah, again, not, not too much experience at all. So did very you, green, did you very hunt? green. Did you ever no, hunt as a young man? Nothing. No, no. no. I went out with Bruce and uh, his father. Uh, they went, we used to go shooting out in Calico. Um, but again, I didn't really have any interest in guns. So, I can definitely say that uh, when I started, I was very naive to the world and uh, very green. Um, I, you know, I love it because you, you you showed your mom. I can't have a BB gun. Look what I got. Now. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she had to deal with it for twenty six years as well. But uh, mom, we're just kidding. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't I, I, again, I had never had any real life experience. I hadn't seen drugs. I hadn't uh, really seen too much crime. I hadn't really been exposed to that side of the world and society. So uh, yeah, I went well, in. Welcome to Las Vegas, then, pal. Yeah, yeah. Again, <laughs> again. You know, probably one of the uh, most interesting places to be a police officer. Uh, oh, I can't. So, yeah. I, I mean, the well, college. Sin City, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I want to circle back something because this is some. It's kind of unique. We all went through. If you remember, like Murph, when you got on DEA, you think about the number of people who applied and the number of people they picked. You think about you. When I got, I was a. I started out as a cop in '82. Then I went to the state patrol in '84. In '84, for 16 positions, 2,000 people applied. Wow. And now, and now, you're lucky if you get 100 people apply 
for 16 positions. You know, I, I mean, did you guys, did you see that happen as well too? I mean, getting 4,000 people or 3,000 people to apply, I mean, Crazy. I, I don't think you can get those kind of numbers anymore. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we were definitely experiencing that now in Vegas, especially after 2020, you know, COVID and everything else that occurred with the riots. And, um, you know, I think we're still struggling to hire people. And, you know, Vegas is interesting in that, you know, I mean, we sit in a bowl, right? We sit in a valley and uh, the pool of candidates is very small, right? I mean, we're only, you know, probably just above 2 million residents uh, in the Clark County area. And so our, our department had did a lot of uh, trying to reach out to other agencies and really try to poach people from, you know, other cities and, you know, uh, a lot of outreach to California. You know, we were so close, you know, three, four hour drive from, you know, downtown Los Angeles. So um, they did a lot of outreach to other cities. And I know they're still doing that. But I, I you know, last I'd heard when I talked to uh, several friends that were, you know, lieutenants in the recruiting section that, you um, you know, they, they still struggle with it because, you know, a lot of agencies are able to give significant hiring bonuses now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our agency really hasn't kind of gone that route. Um, or my former agency really hasn't tried to go that route and just didn't really have the ability. So again, it, it further limits your pool of candidates that you're drawing from to, to hire on into law enforcement. So and guess whose starting salary is $123,000 a year and they still can't get enough people for their academy? Now, who's that? San Francisco. Oh, yeah. That's a rough no. city. Yeah. That's Not true. only I from the cost Francisco. of living, right? One hundred and twenty-three thousand is probably a, equivalent to sixty thousand in Virginia. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and we can thank you know the uh, all those wonderful idiots that were you know promoting defund the police and you know let's get rid of cops altogether. Let's don't honor the law. Let's you know our country wasn't formed on the rule of law. You know, we're going to do what the hell we want to do. You're a bunch of freaking idiots. Look at the mess we got now. Yeah, Look it at comes you, back. after New Year's. You are just getting into it, man. I know it. I know it. I'm getting cranky and crotchety in my old age here. Uh, I think it certainly comes back to bite you in the butt a little bit, you know, uh, having it's, those, having it's those conversations. Yeah. It's, it's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in our country. Well, and I think it, like to your point, it has long-term effects. In other words, you cannot hire your way out of the current problem. Um, we're down so many people. There's no way to hire out of it. Um, yep. So let's let's get back to you. So you go through the, how long was your academy? Oh, at the time, I think it was probably, I'm going to say 26 weeks, maybe. 26, 28 about weeks. Half, so, so about half wow. a year then, six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was about 20, 26 weeks or so, and it was Just not living, there. so... Oh, Sorry? okay. Oh, you just answered the question. It was not living. So you was, had to find a place to live while you were there too. I did. And you know, so ironically enough, I'm going to give Bruce George? another shout out. Or, I mean, you know? Bruce. Yeah. So Bruce had, uh, there was a, a, a cadet that uh, was going, transitioning from Las Vegas Metro as a cadet into the police recruit role and she needed a roommate. So uh, Bruce knew her from the police department. So he kind of set us up together um, and I ended up having a, a, a pretty easy spot and just transitioned right into uh, the apartment where she was at and uh, she had a room available for me. So yeah, it worked out perfectly. I, I really thought you were going to say I ended up having an affair. No, me? No. <laughs> did she become your wife? She did not. No, 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 okay. no. We, uh, no, just friends and uh yeah I and mean, it was great because she you know already had the exposure to the police department so uh, it was definitely beneficial to know somebody that you know kind of had the codes and the uh the kind of rules and policy of the department that i could lean on okay I mean, we can't go but we gotta ask no, just a couple more here we go. because no, 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 i'm not i'm not gonna get i'm not going where you think we're going it's one thing to have a couple guys be roommates because you can walk around your underwear you know go you yeah. know you guys are slops i'm sorry <laughs> how different was it I mean, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this, but hey, look, you're a dude. She's a dudette. I mean, the norms that you would live with with other guys like in a college, you know, like live in a dorm or in a fraternity, yeah. completely <clears throat> different set of rules. I mean, did, did you get in trouble for not cleaning up after yourself or picking up your underwear? Or, you know, how no, that she was. It? No, she was great. I don't remember there ever being any real conflict, you know, because I think majority of the time, you know, Monday through Friday, we were at the academy from, you know, probably 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we'd come home and study and we were going to bed um, separately. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, you know, we'd go to bed and then we'd get up and do it again. So, I mean, there were, and on the weekends we were studying with our group. So there wasn't really much time, uh, you know, to get in trouble. So, um, 
Yeah, she was great, and uh, you know, she was definitely uh, a good person to have a good connect I, I mean, with. I don't know. Again, I, I'm thinking about other. Things. I've heard that young men are, are prone to you know farting in front of each other and, and snotting around and you know being. <laughs> I always rude tried to be rude. very respectful of her. <laughs> yeah, we always we always tried to be. She was actually dating, uh, I think, relatively quickly when we started the academy. One of the other academy mates that we were with. So. Um, oh. Yeah, it was yeah. great. It worked out. It worked out really, really well. So there's an old get, saying that says, "How do you? How do? You, how? What is the point? You know, when you've been married long enough, it's when you can fart in front of your wife." So, yeah. <laughs> that's, anyway, let's let's not go to fart jokes because that's what guys do. But uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, Kai and I, our fortieth anniversary is later this year. We never, I've never farted in front of her. Oh, you lying sack! <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> Not once, yeah, multiple times. Oh, baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, well, so you get through so the academy. Anything uh, interesting we need to know about from you from the academy? Because we do have our sources. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of stories. I mean, I obviously got a lot of shit for working at Disneyland. That was a big running joke. Uh, you know, that I went from working with one character to another character, you know, from <laughs> just different types, right? Characters at Disneyland to characters on the streets. Um, so that was a big thing. Uh, there but you know i I didn't the academy was great for me you know i had just come out of college so the academics were easy for me you know i just finished you know playing soccer in college so the physical fitness was not an issue for me so um you know again i talked to bruce about it and he told me hey this is a game you got to play in the academy and they're going to scream and yell at you and no matter what you do it's not going to be right they're going to find something uh so you know i really did not have any issues academy i actually really you know i don't know how often you guys hear this but i i did enjoy my academy time um i had a great time it was easy for me i really didn't have any issues um you know, maybe overthought stuff, maybe a little bit too much. Cause again, I, you know, I'd come in, I was probably one of the few people that had come in with, you know, a degree already under their belt being so young. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I didn't have any issues in the Academy. I, I vividly remember. So, uh, you know, starting out, they line you up and you're ready to get thrashed right that day one. And, uh, it was, uh, January. So it was cold, you know, in Vegas, you're standing outside freezing already. And, um, the, what the big, consideration was you know who's going to be class leader first day right because that person's just going to get absolutely destroyed by the tax staff <laughs> and uh fortunately enough uh he's a captain in our department on on vegas now uh who's still a really good friend of mine but he came out uh day one during and uh you know we have to go out and announce ourselves uh prior to the academy starting and he came out and said something to the effect of uh you know i was in the marine corps and there's nothing that you guys can there do you go. That will, there's our leader <laughs> yeah, there's nothing that you can do that's going to uh bother me or affect me or touch me and so uh we all knew like whoo thanks and uh <laughs> Cap- captain jose hernandez uh thank you very much because he took the heat off of all of us uh that day one and i vividly remember standing in formation you know at the position of attention and uh the uh, the tax staff promptly went into his locker and threw every single <laughs> item out of his locker into the cold in front of all of us and, and uh, we what? all my son-in-law is a marine formerly on active duty that happened that was the weekly occurrence you know yeah yeah, so we uh, we gladly thanked him for the uh, for the respite <laughs> for the week of not having to have us get yelled at because he got destroyed that entire week. Did he did uh, he maintain if, his temper? If not longer, he did. You know, he did a really good job, and uh, he was a great class leader. We rotated class leaders, so we knew at some point everybody uh, would have to be class leader, but uh, mm-hmm. nobody wanted to be the first one. You know, because I think by the time I finally became class leader. You know, it's probably closer to the middle of the academy. And, you know, you kind of had your bearing and you knew what was going on. And, you know, you weren't getting yelled at as much because you kind of settled in. But, uh, yeah, that, that was a very stressful first day. So lots well, of I mean, crying, he, lots of people leaving and throwing up and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, with, his, with his uh, opening statement there, he kind of threw down the gauntlet right there. He did. Yeah. And he paid for it the entire 26 <laughs> weeks for sure. But uh, he's done really well for himself on the department. So Excellent. he's doing something right. So let's close out your academy. Experience. What was the, for you, what was the most fun you had at the academy? <laughs> You know, I think I, I, what I really enjoyed was we had a really good group. You know, we were broken up by uh, platoons based on your uh, your last name. And so we had a really good close-knit group. Um, I had a really close friend uh, that uh, was in the academy with me, uh, Rafael Ramos. Uh, so we were really close. He really struggled academically in the academy. Again, he was a Marine, but he was a grunt. And, you know, he just wanted to go smash stuff. And he wasn't really too focused on schoolwork. So, uh, you know, having come from college, it was really a, a great opportunity for me to really mentor him. So 
I, I think I felt a, a very good sense of accomplishment knowing that I kind of drug him along with me academically through the academy and was able to kind of get him through that. And, you know, and he turned out to be a really great cop and we worked several years together on patrol. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I think just that sense of accomplishment of being able to kind of get him over the hump of, you know, having the academic struggles. But, uh, you know, we had, we, we, we had a really good group. I mean, we whittled down, but I can honestly say all of our group was really close. And, uh, you know, you, you obviously you do a lot of trauma bonding when you're getting yelled at for 26 <laughs> weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. So graduation day hits and now yep. you're getting ready to take the mean streets. How do you get, how do, how are our first assignments handed out? I mean, everybody, I would say what well, it depends too. Cause like sometimes, you know, in sheriff's office, not everybody goes to the street water. You have to start in the jail, you know, then you go to the street in some places, but so how does it work with Las Vegas Metro? I mean, you go, do you go right to a, uh, a squad, you go right to a precinct, how does that, you know, what's your terminology? How does that work? Yeah. So with Vegas Metro, uh, you actually hire on either as a corrections officer or a police officer. So you pick your kind of career path when you hire on. So there's no real crossover. Although uh, back then when uh, when I was in the academy, I think the first six or eight weeks, it was joint. So we did have corrections officers that were in our academy with us. And then about the six week uh, six week mark, you ended up kind Is of separating. Is that pretty much just learning the, the laws and everything? Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Policy and procedure and things. Yeah. A lot of it, to be honest, is a lot of just physical fitness that they were, you know, whipping people into shape. And then about the six week mark, we separated and the corrections officers, they went into their own academy and then we continued on with our police academy. So, um, so I, when we graduated, uh, again, I remember, uh, <laughs> they gave us bullets, but they said, you can't have any bullets in your gun until you, uh, I think you have to load up right before graduation. Right. So, you know, you're carrying an empty gun, you're in a full uniform, uh, and with no bullets. You, why is that policy in place? You know why that policy is in place? Because <laughs> I, I, at <laughs> some point in the previous, <laughs> some point in history, a gun was discharged. <clears throat> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yep. Somebody probably did something stupid the night before, you know, when they had bullets in their gun. So I remember we loaded up uh, while we were, I think, waiting for a graduation, uh, put our, you know, our bullets in our gun and our magazines and uh, walked out. Uh, so we actually graduated at MGM Grand and they had a, it's probably the most hideous graduation photo ever in the history of our department. Um, but for some reason there was a, there used to be a theme park at MGM Grand, and uh, there used to be this big uh, pirate ship type boat. And for whatever reason, somebody decided that it was going to be a great idea for us to stand in front of this big pirate ship and take a photo. And again, literally, so in our our, our academy building, they line up you know every class's photo by year, and we are certainly in the anomaly in all the group photos that we're the only ones that have has this horrendous pirate ship in the back. Um, of our photo. So yeah, we'll live in infamy of the class of 198 for that. I remember that's Captain Jack Sparrow. Captain yes. Jack. That was the day you almost caught Captain Jack Sparrow. I got to tell you one of the best concerts I ever went to it was during a convention, but it was at the MGM Grand. We I was I was uh because you go there's you go up and it's like you're at the upper tier but you walk down and then there's that catwalk that comes out from the stage. Yep. And I was uh, 15 feet away, 20 feet away all night from uh, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, Aerosmith, oh, wow. our headliner. Yeah. yeah. What, a, what a great show. But that's one thing Vegas does bring in, man. They do bring in great shows. So you graduate, Barney. Barney, you're allowed to put a bullet, take the bullet yeah, out of your finally, pocket. They finally trusted me enough to put a bullet in, uh, in my firearm. And so, um, you know, before you graduate the academy, you know at least what shift and what area command you're going to work. So we call them, uh, we don't call them precincts, we call them stations or area commands. And, uh, and so, give us an overview, too, of how is, how is Las Vegas. First of all, a couple questions. Number one, why is it called Las Vegas Metro? Because you're Clark County. At some point, you know, was it consolidated? Like you've got county police departments. And then you kind of give us the structure to about how Las Vegas Metro was divided up. So it's actually a good thing that I brushed up on my history. So uh, yeah, in 1973, so it, we did have Las Vegas Police Department, and then we had the Clark County Sheriff's Department. Uh, so they ended up merging together in 73 to become Las Vegas Metro. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic. So, you know, they took several parts of the police department, they took several parts of the, the Sheriff's Department and kind of molded them together. So we're called police officers, but we're uh, the head of our agency is an elected sheriff. 
So there's a little bit of a dynamic there. Uh, they end up taking the, I believe, the police cars from one agency. They took the uniforms from the uh, sheriff's department. So we're kind of a little bit of a hodgepodge. Um, you got the so brown uniforms, but the black and whites, right? We do. Yeah, absolutely. So it's again, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge. So we get a lot of people that you know kind of get confused sometimes because you know we'll get referred to as sheriffs all the time out here. So essentially, we do act as the county sheriff because you know we're the main law enforcement agency in the valley. And you've got um, the jail, and you've got we, the civil process, right? And all the other yep. stuff. Yeah, we have all that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, day to day, we are police officers on our badge. It says police officer, but you know, we don't have a shield. We have a, a, star, a star, like a sheriff star. So again, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge. So uh, that's kind of how that uh, how that worked out. So Vegas itself, uh, I think when I hired on, there was maybe six substations or area commands. Um, I initially got signed to, I spoke Spanish, so I initially got uh, signed to Northeast Area Command where there was a fairly uh, high Hispanic population. Um, I'm assuming that was done on purpose. Um, but I think now we're at uh, at least 10 substations now. And then, uh, you know, we have Airport uh, Area Command and a bunch of different other ones now. Uh, How many sworn? Kind of uh, satellite stations. Um, sworn. Again, this number is always probably in flux. I would say if I had to estimate, uh, probably 3,000 to 3,500 police officers and then probably another 1,500 corrections officers. Okay. I think at one point we were you know, probably the 6th, 7th, 8th largest police department in the in the country. So, yeah, relatively big. But again, when I hired on, it was you know, probably closer to maybe 2,000 total. So, you know, you knew everyone on the department, um, you know, and now when, you know, when I retired, uh, going to briefings and working cases and stuff, I, I wouldn't know lieutenants and captains on the department that I'd never seen before. So not quite sure where they were hiding out their entire department. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, you'd go into to graveyard briefings and it's, you know, 21 year old police officers and you have no idea who they are. So yeah, the dynamic changed quite a bit, you know, the, the 25 plus years that I was on the department. What rank were you when you retired? So I ended up retiring as a detective. Um, <clears throat> didn't really have any interest in promoting. You know, I, I contemplated a little bit, but I, I really enjoyed the grunt work. I really enjoyed uh, doing the casework. And, you know, although I didn't have rank per se, uh, the department, you know, and I had great supervisors that uh, realized that, you know, I, I kind of knew my shit and they left me alone. And I was able to do a lot of things that, um, you know, people at the rank of lieutenant or captain above were doing. Um, and they, you know, they trusted me with that. So again, I didn't, I didn't feel like I really needed the rank to be able to accomplish what I wanted to do on the department. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so no, but we no can, rank structure, like a D one, D two, D three, like they do in LA or anything like that. No. So we, uh, we have, you know, police officers, you know, you start out and you're on probation, you graduate probation. I think you get promoted to police officer two. And then, uh, the detective rank is actually, I, th I believe it's called detective PO two, a two. Um, and then from there you end up going into, uh, uh, the sergeant role. Uh, but we're like a lot of agencies where you promote, you end up having to go back to patrol to start out again. So I know, uh, most of uh, the sheriff's departments in California are like that. So you, know, you promote to sergeant, you go back to patrol, you go back to the jail, same thing with Lieutenant. So I didn't really have uh, the interest in doing that. You know, I, I got pretty comfortable where I was at my assignments i love my assignments you know I, I love the flexibility of being a detective and kind of making my own schedule and coming and going a lot you know i can say that our department was very good about encouraging us to be good partners with the community so volunteering so you know i was able to break away and do a lot of things uh during my shift that uh was not you know uh, traditional police work i was able to do a lot of community oriented police and stuff and did any of that involve going to any of the strip bars not off duty, uh, <laughs> on duty. Yes, uh, that I was think, always uh, that was always one of the funny things. You know, whenever those calls for service came out, uh, the area commands that I worked in, there was only one strip club. But uh, inevitably, you know, whenever a call for service came out there, it's interesting that you know everybody's available and uh, free to respond <laughs> to that call for service. But the I might uh, be on a homicide, but I'm available. Hey, look, yeah, that the, guy's not going anywhere. I'm coming. The, yeah. the stolen vehicle report of the burglar report, you know, sits for several <laughs> hours. But the uh, the drunk at the strip club, but there's you know. 10 units that are rolling to that. <laughs> I think uh, Bruce might have some uh, experience in I'm those sure locations. Bruce does. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to get him on here soon. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got to hey, well, let's talk about then um, your eyes. But first, we t before we talk about going for patrol to investigations, uh, detective, when's the last time you had a uniform on? 
full time or optional? Because I, I've put it on a couple of different times. Last time I had a full time uniform on was probably when I was a. So we call them tack officers, but essentially the drill uh, drill instructors at the police academy. So I was a tack officer at the academy from probably. I'm trying to think uh, timeline. Probably 2008 to 2010. I had a full-time uniform on and, you know, I, again, I still love doing police work. I mean, even up until the last, you know, couple days of my career, you know, I was still out jobbing it, you know, I was still out handling calls. And if I, if I had my radio on and there was something close, you know, I would throw my, my tack vest on and I would still respond and help out the patrol officers. So, um, you know, we'll talk about this maybe towards the end about the UNLV shooting, the yeah. mass shooting that we had that kind of ended my career. Um, well, let's rephrase you, that. It didn't end your career. Your career yeah, ended prior to you retired. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it was the the kind of the coup de grace to the uh, to my retirement. So, um, so well, yeah. So I probably yeah, two thousand eight to two thousand ten. Yeah. So let's go. So let's talk about then. You get out of the academy. You work. How long are you working the streets before you you promote into your next assignment? So I worked the streets probably five years. You know, you all everybody starts out pretty much on a graveyard squad at the time. You know, it's mm-hmm. all brand new newbie cops. Uh, so we, I started out in, on graveyard patrol, um, ended up, you know, getting some seniority, ended up going to day shift at one point. Do you uh, bid is, for shifts? We do. Yeah. Yeah. You bid for shifts, uh, once a year. Um, you know, a lot of it's based on your shift and days off and who the supervisor you're working for is. Right. So you want to work for a good boss. Uh, so I think I worked, you know, sh- uh, general patrol work, uh, straight patrol, um, probably two, three, four years. And then, uh, ended up transitioning to a field training officer, uh, probably year four or five. Uh, so I trained for probably two, two years or so as a, as a field training officer, which is again, another interesting dynamic. So it's, a, you know, doing patrol, but it's a, a different kind of, um, aspect to patrol, right? Cause you're mentoring and teaching a brand new person right out of the Academy. So did that for about, uh, five years or so. And then ultimately got called up on a TDY to our gang unit at the time we were having a summer of some pretty major gang problems. Who are um, your so major they, gangs there? Uh, you know, we have everything. I mean, pretty much anything okay. you can think of nationwide we have, uh, in the gang world. I mean, we're kind of considered a, um, a suburb of Los Angeles, so inevitably all the gangs from Los Angeles kind of migrate out out to out east to to uh, to Vegas. And so I always not that kind long of, of a drive, is it? No, it's. Uh, I mean, depending on where you're at in Southern California, it could be as quick as three hours. Yeah, to get to Southern California. So I always kind of when I was in the gang unit. You know, I always equated it to, uh, you know, California was kind of the varsity gang members and uh, Vegas was always kind of the junior varsity gang members Um, because we got there was a lot of crossover and a lot of gang members in California would come out from uh, from there to come from California to Vegas and kind of punk out our gang members and sell drugs and do robberies and things. And then they would jump back on the highway and, you know, be gone in a couple hours and. I you hate know, people high, who high just can't California. take care of their own patch. They got to come, you know, always playing somebody else's patch, run things. Yeah, yeah. Well, saying your own gang crime. What, what about you know Las Vegas for a long time had the reputation, obviously, for organized crime. You th- you look at a lot of the good mob movies, like Goodfellas. Yep. Yep. Everything revolves around Vegas. You know, Ocean's Ten, Eleven, what are they up to? Ocean yeah. Ocean's Ninety Nine or something like that. Yeah. Um, what, what was what was the prevalence of organized crime during your career there? So, you know, I probably wasn't exposed to it too much. We have certain units in, our, in the department that handle that sort of stuff, that deal with, you know, our intelligence section um, that takes a look at that sort of stuff. But, you know, I, so I hired on in 98. It was probably towards the end of all that coming. You know, it was more corporate by the time I got there. You know, so, you know, big corporations had really pushed out a lot of that kind of organized crime and mob influence, I think, mafia sort of activity. I'm sure it occurred at some points, uh, you know, but I wasn't really privy to that and wasn't really exposed to it. I never worked the strip, uh, per se, as an area command, which is our convention center area command. Uh, or downtown, which would have been uh, our downtown area command, you know, kind of the old Fremont Street experience area. Uh, I never really worked those uh, full time uh, in my patrol time. So I wasn't really exposed to that too much. I think if it was going to exist and linger on, it probably would have been in that in those particular areas. Um, but again, I think by the time I got on the department, I mean, it was very, very corporate. So you had, you know, MGM Grand and Caesars Palace and these these major organizations that were really pushing the business model and pushing. And they get too big to extort. Out. Yeah, they become so big, you can't really extort a major corporation like that. Absolutely. Not like you can yeah. A small and business, yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I, you know, I know that there were times some of the early attorneys that we were dealing with, you know, when I first started going to court, you know, in the late '90s, early 2000s, there were still mob attorneys that were floating around, and you know, we had Oscar Goodman, who was our mayor, very early, early on when I moved out here, and you know, he was an old, you know, mob defense attorney as well. So, I mean, there was still a little bit of uh, stuff that's kind of floating around the periphery of it, and you, know, you were still very aware of it on the department and very cognizant of it, but um, I can't say that it really impacted me day to day. What about the uh, bikers? Yeah, we saw some of that as well. Um, again, that's a completely different section as well. But, um, you know, we, we we dealt with it uh, at certain points. You're talking about like outlaw motorcycle gang type mm-hmm. stuff? Yeah, right. so we dealt with right. that quite a bit. Um, mostly, you know, they would come in for motorcycle shows and car shows, and then we would have problems. Obviously, we have the Laughlin River Run as well. Yeah. Um, and we had a pretty major shooting there. Um we had one I of the guys that was uh, connected to that. Wasn't we're talking? Wasn't it Jaybird? That was. I believe uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. So that that really changed our department's approach to handling kind of outlaw motorcycle gangs, and um, you know the way that they kind of looked at that as well. Um, after that incident in Laughlin, and I remember that impacted me because I had uh, joined the gang unit shortly after that, and so there was a, there was always a big surge down there in Laughlin to try to obviously prevent another casino shootout uh, like like uh, like occurred in Laughlin. Oh, and which happened you know, a few years later in Waco. Upstanding citizens. <laughs> yeah, upstanding. So, because um, what we want to do, we're, we kind of set some background, and I, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff there we could get into, but let's start let's start setting the context from you moving into investigations, what kind of things you were focusing on, because ultimately the first part of the story is going to involve October 1st, you know, 2017. So yeah. when did you start getting in, into as an investigator? When did you start becoming a full-time investigator? So I, I transitioned to the gang unit. Uh, and when, at the time you went to gang unit, you started doing gang enforcement. So you were actually out, you know, grabbing people and arresting people and chasing people and, um, you know, stopping people in the streets doing pedestrian stops. So, um, you know, I started out into that, but I think fairly early on, you know, I, I realized that I wanted to get into the more investigative type role into the gang unit. And so uh, our gang unit at the time had investigations, enforcement, and intelligence. And so the, kind of the normal progression was you got your feet wet doing gang enforcement. And then once the supervisors in the gang unit thought, hey, he's a good gang detective, um, you know, we'd move you over to the investigative section. So I kind of started to dabble fairly early on. And if I saw kind of a misdemeanor battery or something fairly easy that I could kind of get my feet wet wet on the investigative side, I asked the supervisors. And again, I was very proactive in my career and tried to really think outside of the box. So again, I had good supervisors. I said, yeah, go ahead and start dabbling. And then, um, you know, probably after doing two or three years of gang enforcement, they brought me over to do gang investigations full time as well. So um, I stayed in the same section, but I just transitioned over to an investigative team. Uh, And that was probably... uh, 2004 or five, maybe. Okay. Um, and so I transitioned into the gang unit and um, I started doing investigations full time on, on a gang level, right? And so, you know, I, I spoke Spanish, so I dealt a lot with Hispanic gangs. You know, we were dealing a lot with African American gangs. Again, the, you know, your normal stuff you'd see in Los Angeles, right? We had 18th Street and 28th Street and White Fence and. Uh, you know, Marasara Trucha and, you know, uh, Bloods and Crips. And so pretty much anything you could think of we had in Vegas, right? It was kind of a microcosm for what you saw in the nation. We had, you know, all the Chicago gangs that ended up in Vegas as well. So pretty much everybody ended up in Vegas at some point. So again, it was a great experience uh, working the gang unit. And I can truly say that's where I learned to be a cop was in the gang unit. Well, that's, I mean, that's when you're dealing with the toughest, I mean, the, the people who have no respect for law, no respect for rules. I'm looking at what's going on. Have you been tracking what's going on in Ecuador right now with all of these armed gangs that are taking over like a live broadcast on a television stage? No, I haven't seen that. No. Well, they're just, I mean, it's it's rampaging. If, if folks don't think gangs are, you know, dangerous, especially MS-13, Mara Salvatrucha, yeah. the troops of El Salvador, these guys are, it's, it's a nasty business, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were dealing with the worst of the worst, but I can honestly say that. Um, you know, I'm sure my family wasn't too happy about the fact that I chose to go to the gang unit, right? Um, because you're dealing with the, you know, probably some of the most violent people, uh, in the, in the Valley, uh, at least from a, you know, shooting perspective, I think. Um, but, you know, I, I can say that, you know, th- the way they treated us when we uh, rolled up to the scene versus the way they treated patrol officers was vastly different. I think they understood and they respected the fact, you know, we understood their, their subculture. Right. And, uh, so it was always, if, if that, as long as they gave us respect, we gave them respect. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, they would be completely disrespectful and yelling and treating the patrol officers, you know, our, our regular uniform patrol officers 
like crap. Um, but then when we would pull up and we wore BDUs, so we had a tactical uniform, we looked kind of swattish and we, you know, we were all in greens. And so, um, uh, you know, we look like army men. Uh, so I think having that look, um, helped us out. It was very intimidating. And so there was a, a different level of respect when we would deal with the gang members than when they would deal with patrol. So yeah, we had our issues, right? And it was great. You know, we were running and gunning and chasing constantly. And uh, again, uh, probably some of the most fun experiences I ever had working the streets was in the gang unit. Um, but there was always an, I, you know, and you guys can probably speak to this too. There was always a little bit of an unwritten code, right? That as long as you respect us, we'll respect you. And, uh, you know, even though they were violent towards each other, um, there was very few instances uh, that I can recall off the top of my head where they were violent towards us in law enforcement mm -hmm. at the time. Now, I think that has changed quite yeah. a bit now, right? So I think uh, just society in general has changed. And I think the, uh, the viewpoint towards law enforcement has changed quite a bit. But, you know, at that time, um, yeah, there was, an, I, and I can say that, you know, my predecessors in the gang unit, uh, they used to have the old raid jackets, the old rampart style vehicles, and they used to wear these, uh, they used to wear these yellow raid jackets and, um, a bright yellow, like a, like a bumblebee. And so they had made these cards that, that they would give out to gang members whenever they got arrested that said, you got stung by a bee. And it was a bright yellow, like business card. And so <laughs> I think oh a lot of the groundwork was laid for us, you know, old school policing, right. Yeah. Where you could go a lot more hands on and you didn't take as much shit from people. Um, you know, and there weren't body cameras, so you could get away with a lot more, um, within the context of policy and the constitution, but it was a lot more hands-on, I think. So I think, uh, you know, when I was there, uh, it was a very different uh, type of policing that's going on now. But uh, yeah, so we would joke around about, you know, hey, you got stung by a bee. It was kind of the running joke. By the time I got there, it was gone, but there was, you know, still lingering cards floating around the office that you could kind of reminisce I'd about the, old, the good old days. Those, <laughs> like <laughs> the good old days. Float like a butterfly, sting <laughs> like a bee. Yeah. All right. So, but you said that um, you were, you, is, there a, is there a time where you transitioned though from the gang into regular investigations where you're no longer assigned to the gang unit or were, did you stay in gangs the whole time? No. So I stayed in gangs for five years <clears throat> i really got tired of the call out uh, and the kind of the dynamic and the politics that were going on with gangs at the time and so i ended up transitioning out um i ended up going to our academy to be an instructor uh, so i taught uh several topics at the academy and was a again a tack officer drill instructor at our police academy for probably another three four years and and, um, and admit it admit <clears throat> it you enjoyed it didn't you you admitted you know, raining down retribution for all the times you got screamed at when you were there. Uh, so with a little bit of a caveat. So, uh, <laughs> I did enjoy it. It was a, it was a good time, but I, I also realized that there was kind of an end goal to it, right. That there was a purpose for us, you know, screaming and yelling. Um, you know, I, I certainly probably had a reputation for being one of the meaner tech officers at the Academy. And I'm sure any of my former recruits that happened to listen to this <laughs> podcast will certainly agree. And I, 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 I heard it regularly when I would bump into them after the fact uh, on my career. Um, but, you know, I, I also found that, um, you know, you can only yell at somebody for so long, right? Before it just becomes white noise, right? Yep. So after a while, it just kind of comes in one ear and out the other. And, you know, uh, there was different ways you had to try to motivate people or approach people to try to get them uh, to either be successful or, or to, frankly, to resign because, you know, the police work wasn't for them, right? And you don't want to mm -hmm. see them get hurt or well, But you also want to find out street. sooner rather than later before you invest a whole lot more time, money and effort and lawsuits, you know, somewhere down the line. Absolutely. Yeah. And my goal was, you know, I didn't ever want to see any of my recruits get hurt <clears throat> once they got out on the streets. And I don't want to see, you know, obviously them get killed and, you know, have to deal with their families and stuff after that. So, um, so yes, uh, but it was also a good end, you know, so I, I enjoyed the academy time. I enjoyed being able to PT and stay in shape while I was on duty and, um, you know, motivate people and teach, you know, it's kind of where I really started teaching as well a lot at the academy, right. Um, which I, I do enjoy. Um, but it was, it was a good mix. You know, when we had downtime and the recruits were in class, I was able to go out and get a patrol car and I, I went out and did regular patrol and just jumped in and helped out a patrol squad to kind of keep my skills fresh. Um, cause I wanted the recruits to see that, you know, I wasn't just sitting at a desk. Um, but probably most importantly, you know, I was able to finish grad school while I was at the Academy, right. Cause there was a lot of downtime to study and kind of, uh, work on uh, writing papers and, and focusing on my education. And I think a lot of people that go to the Academy, they either, they either go the, 
you know, I'm going to get my grad degree or I'm going to get my bachelor's degree and go the traditional school route, or they go the route that where I'm going to study to become a sergeant or a lieutenant. So, you know, I really focus on my education. And so I was able to finish grad school while I was in the academy. Where did you do your grad school work at? So I did my grad school online. I did it at Columbia Southern University. Okay. Finished that. And then I ended up uh, kind of a glutton for punishment. I ended up going back to San Diego State and got my forensic psych certification on top of that as well. Um, you know, towards the, uh, uh, probably towards the end of my academy time as well. So, so what'd you um, get your degree in? Your master's so I, in? Yeah. So my bachelor's in I'm almost like my master's in criminal justice administration. And then my post-grad uh, certifications are in forensic psych. Um, I dabbled a little bit uh, with my doctorate in uh, psychology, but I, I haven't really found a good fit school-wise. So I, it's still on my list. And uh, I think I'll still always be in school at some point, but I just need to find a good fit for my doctoral program as well. Well, you, law, law enforcement is like anything else. You got to be a continuous student. You got to continuously learn. <clears throat> Things change, Absolutely. you know, all the time. Um, so let's let's start talking about you getting into your investigative role that leads up to October first, twenty seventeen. So give us the background on that. Yeah, so I, I I'm at the academy, uh, you know, teaching and doing the uh, the drill instructor stuff, and um, <clears throat> ended up realizing. Um, you know, that I kind of wanted to do a little bit more international stuff. Uh, at that time, our department was starting to kind of build a counterterrorism section. And, you know, I had spent some time overseas. I was an exchange student in Russia in high school. So I had a little bit of exposure to kind of international stuff. Um, so I ended up paying for myself to go to Israel to do some counterterrorism training, kind of to pad my resume, uh, which was a great experience. Loved it. And uh, so, t- again, I, I ended up testing. You have to test it, with Vegas Metro, you have to test for every unit you want to go to. Um, there's no real directed transfers. Uh, so I tested for our counterterrorism section. I uh, got on the hiring list, uh, the the selection list for that. And then so I left the academy and then I got transitioned over to our counterterrorism section. Uh, at the time, was located down by the airport. It's since now at our uh, headquarters building. But um, hey, yeah, rewind so for I, a second, because uh, there was an interesting, I used to work with some guys that ran a program called Gilly, but uh, it was out of, uh, of Georgia, but they would take officers over, do exactly that. You do this cross-pollination. They'd bring some Israelis yeah. over. They'd go over there. When you went over there, did you did you say you self-funded that you went on your own dime or was well, that I paid a- on my own money? Yeah. I paid for myself to go. Yeah. Was it, yeah, what kind that, of program was it that allowed you to go over there? I can't think of it off the top of my head. I can get you guys the information on what the group was. Um, but there was a the guy's name is Henry Morgan Stern. He, uh, he had a program, uh, where he had good connects over in Israel. And so we would go over, um, they did it every year. I'm not sure even if they're doing it anymore, obviously given the context of what's going on now. I think, I think a lot of that has slowed down. Yeah. Because of, yeah. Everything that's gone on, a lot of people it got bad optics for some reason, and they're like, yeah. "Oh, you're just teaching them to be, you know, uh, you're teaching them commando techniques, you know, because they started looking at all the SWAT stuff, the gear people were getting, the tactics. Oh, you're just teaching them to be commandos and killers, you know." Yeah. Yeah, I think it was pretty hot and heavy after 9-11, obviously, right? Um, and then it, I think it's probably died down in some sense, and especially given the conflict there now. Hey players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.